you know, let, let them have their fun. We work it out at a later date and, and um, you know, a few more generations of, of um, you know, what's, you know, let's, let, us, let us slide, okay? You think that's what God is looking at? Let's say you're going to slide, eh? I mean, that's a sitcom I'm talking about. And if in reality, it would happen the same way too. Because I said, if, if I'm coming home, and I say I'm on my way home, and my son is telling me that, oh, daddy, what? that's so fast, we're coming home right away. I mean, so what do you mean? I'm going to say, well, what happened? He said, well, no, daddy, don't come home yet, man. I said, but what, what, what could be the problem? He said, uh, tell me what's going on. Because if you're telling me not to come home when I'm on my way home, then I know something must be wrong, right? This is not your house, this is my house. And Jesus said that this is not your house, wherever you might be, okay? Whatever office you're in, whether you're in church or in the polit politics or whatever, this is not your house, this is my house, okay? When I want to come, I come when I please. You can't tell me when not to come. And because of this racket that's going on upon this earth here, then there's all the more reason why the Father should come and set things in order. But I'm saying to you because people, as the Bible said, even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, people who do not were, they, they like the darkness. They like <clears throat> that God is kept out of the picture. Right? They like that. You know, anything you have to do with you're going to mention something. What are you going to do now? You're going to start singing now. Right? You're going to start talking about God. You're going to open the Bible now. I mean, we, we don't want that now. You're just going to spoil the fun. Okay? And they are missing out on the good things. The good things of eternal life. And they don't want to even try. They would rather huddle down in the darkness and stay away from the light. You understand? The Bible said that when Cain killed his brother, he didn't want to stay where, where God could say anything to him again. So he went to a place and he said, My dad used to say, well, nod. It was like everybody was sleeping down there because you're not hearing the voice of God. So they stay not, right? And not, you don't hear the voice of God, or at least you stay distant from the voice of God, right? You think you can shadow it out and that's not a way, you know, not, right? People would like to be there where they are away from God. Thinking that, you know, it, it, it's a state of mind. They let them feel, well, you know, I'm, I'm okay, you know, and, and God has not seen me, right? Um, um, I remember some years ago there was this, there was this movement was going on um, and they had a, a, a picture showing God and they show him up on a cloud, up in the heaven, and then showing fast asleep. I was, was a teenager at the time? I was blown away. I, such a ridiculous cartoon, a drawing. He said like, don't worry about God, man. He's up in heaven there, fast asleep. Okay, now listen to what the devil does with them. They are not, they're not saying that there is no God. Right? You see the trick in that? There are other people say that. An atheist, oh man, forget about God. Um, who tells you there is a God or whatever? They are saying there is a God. But don't worry about him watching you because he's asleep. So which one is, is better? Because one is saying there is no God and the other one is Acknowledging that there is a God, but he's asleep. Right? So, it comes right back to square one. Because if we have a God who's asleep, then virtually we have, virtually I'm saying, because this is the world now today, everything about virtual. Right? I mean, I'm going to say not even virtually. I'm going to say, in reality, you don't have a God. Because if you have a God, and he's not, he cannot manage, you know, the universe, he cannot manage what's going on because he has to sleep, then he's not God. Remember, remember Elijah told us, and the 
were crying, crying. Oh, Bill, hear us, Bill. Uh, and, and Elijah mocked them. He said, go, go ahead, cry some more. Because you say he's a God. So maybe you need to wake him up. You understand? Because if he's God, you don't need to wake him up. Right? Maybe he's on a journey, Elijah said. You know? And, uh, and, and um, you know, you have to try to, you know, do something to gain his attention. I caught myself with blood. I mean, come on. Don't you see I'm bleeding? I need you. I need you. And Elijah said, you know I'm a God. You're worshiping the devil. Because God doesn't need all of those things to get your attention. Because he's seen you before you, when you're sleeping. Right? What does God have to sleep for? For what? Does he get tired? Is he a human being? Does he live in, in does the sun set upon him? You know what I'm saying? Does his days rotate? Is he living with day and night? Or he made day and night? Which is it? You see, so I'm saying, you see, deception of the devil. One is saying there's no God, the other one is saying there's a God, but he's asleep. Excuse me, let me take a sip of this here. Um, so, here we are. Scripture said here, let me just read it. And it said here, that when that, that when he cometh and knocketh, right, they may open unto him immediately. See that? They're ready. Right? They're not saying, hey Lord, don't come yet. Give us some time to straighten up the house. What, what are you doing today? Are we saying that today? Lord, I need time to straighten up. And I'm saying, excuse me, if you hear this word today, excuse me, if you need to straighten up, excuse me, how long would it take for you to straighten up your house? If you, if you heard that, well, um, the, the teacher was coming from school to see about your, your student, about your child, and you said, wow. She called and said, oh, I'm, I'm just five minutes away, as the saying goes, and I'm, Stopping over, I just wanted to talk to your child. He said, he said, wow, the house is a mess. I can't have somebody come here looking like this, especially with women, you know what I'm saying? Right? And he said, the woman, is a woman coming over to your house, maybe as a teacher, she's going to say, oh, this is a sloppy woman. <laughs> yeah, I'm embarrassed out of the world. And she said, well, what am I supposed to do now? Right? Okay? Now, the point of the matter is this, that for a person who keeps the house in order, when you got that announcement, I, I thought you call it like that, you, can, you don't have to worry. Because the most might be that maybe, you know, maybe you might need to straighten up, pick up something here. But the floor is clean, the kitchen is clean, the, um, you know, the place is, is well, well kept. So it may be just like, Maybe you have to move this or move that. So when you hear this announcement that the bride will come in, or when you hear this, what position does it find you in? How messy is your house? How long is it going to take for you to straighten up that house? Because some people say like, well, all you have to do is just cry a lot of mercy. It doesn't work that way. Okay? Because the house has been straightened up. You know, like the bridegroom come in and see a messy house. Right? And if I, I mean, you, you are a husband and you go out and your wife is at home and you come home and the house is always messy and the children are not kept and things are messy. You myself, maybe not carrying herself right. After a while, you know, it might not be that nice for you to get home, to come home. Because you might be saying like, you know, I come home here now and I mean, I don't like when I get home. Right? You ask a friend maybe like, stop over and come home with you and sit down a little bit. But your house is not in order. Okay? The woman responds with the house. And the house in order. Right? I know women used to come, women come to my house and they used to say like, man, you keep your house good like as a woman. Right? But that has to do with my mother. She grew me. Okay? So she grew all of us in a way to 
take care of the house. But I'm just saying to you that every one of us have a house, right? This house, right? Right? This house. As your heart is sold. How long is it going to take for you to get your house in order? Right? Because if it was five minutes, then God has given you five minutes already. And if you need five more minutes, He gave you another five minutes on top of that. And if you need another five minutes, He gave me another five minutes too. Did I need five more minutes? Yes, He gave me another five minutes. Did I need another five minutes? Yes, He gave me another five minutes. Did I need another five minutes? Yes, He gave me another five minutes. Did I need another five minutes? Yes, He gave me another five minutes. Do you get a picture? Do I say that again? I said, did I need another five minutes? Yes, He gave me another five minutes. For all we like sheep have gone astray, and we have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Right? And the scripture is telling him, right? He was wounded, right? For uh, he was it was bruised for iniquities, right? He was wounded for transgressions. The chastisement of a peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. So God gave us a, a five minutes to straighten up. And we asked for another five minutes, he gave us another five minutes. The point is this. When will we stop asking for another five minutes? Because uh, that five minutes is going to run out. Uh, constantly asking for another five minutes is going to run out. Because it's going to coincide with when you're asking for five minutes, it's only two more minutes before the bridegroom should come. So while you're trying to get a five minutes, after the second minute, the bridegroom comes, and you're still not ready. Because you were waiting for another three minutes, which still, you wouldn't be ready anyway. Because you're just constantly asking for another five minutes. So just have women take pride in their homes, and keeping it out in order. It doesn't matter where, where the house, how humble it is. They take pride in it. I remember I worked with this, um, this girl um, many years ago, and she told me, so when, when I spread my bed, nobody come to my house, come sit in my bed, okay? Some people, they have a sofa, they cover it with some kind of covering because they don't want to get messed up. If anything, well, they can't take the covering off, right, and wash it, right? I mean, they take pride in their little house. It doesn't matter what it is, whether a little wooden house or a little house on the prairie, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Okay? So can we take that kind of pride in our house, in our houses, right? Okay? That even at five minutes notice, it could be ready. Alright? And if we, as we do a five minutes ready, then we bring it down to four minutes, to three minutes, to two minutes, to one minute, and to zero minute. That, I mean, anybody could just stop in your house and you don't have to straighten up anything because it's already in order. How about that? There's some women are like that. You know? They can't stand the slightest untidiness. As soon as you use a plate, at least you wash and put away. As soon as it dry, everything I put in the cupboard. Everything. Spit and spam. Constant. And they're not going to bed unless their kitchen is fine and all this is done. They have a schedule for cleaning everything, dusting. Constantly. So they don't have to worry about if mommy should stop by or some friend should stop by. They don't have to come in and put this, push this under the bed. Push that under there. Let's push this in the closet. Yeah? Is that how some of us would be, right? When the bride will come and knock, who is that? Somebody at the door. You don't even know who it, who it is yet. Somebody at the door. But I never expect anybody to come here. Who that, who that would be? Who is that? Perhaps maybe they'll answer. 
And the person, my answer, said, oh, it's so-and-so. I said, but well, come here, the place is a mess. What are we going to do? Notice the Bible says here that when you come and knock, you must be able to open immediately. There's no time to straighten up anything. All the five minutes have expired. As I said to you, when you asked for the last five minutes, the bridegroom was going to come after one minute. So your extra four minutes, you won't get it. And you still won't be ready either. Because the Bible said, if we go back to Matthew 25, the same thing it says here. And let, let's read this thing here, it says here. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came, and they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. So those who had their houses in order, okay, they were able to welcome in the bridegroom. How about you today? Are you, is your house in order? Are you able to welcome in the bridegroom? The Bible says here, Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, and he shall gird himself. That's the way he did in the time of the Passover, the supper. And make them to sit down to me, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. So he said, he can come in the first watch of the night. You know, first three hours, second three hours, the third, fourth, whatever time he comes, he said, blessed are those servants. And notice the scripture speaks about the coming of the Lord as not as a daytime event, but as a nighttime event. And not saying that the Lord wouldn't, couldn't come in the day, but he's just saying to you that in the night, that's when people tend to sleep. That's when you have darkness. You have the street lights, yes? But when you're driving out there, I was, I, um, I was driving there this week, and it's such a, a beautiful thing when you, you have the daylight, and the night comes down, and you are in, you can see, yes, and you have your headlight, but it's not the same. So when they, the beautiful thing, when the day breaks and the night, the light comes back again, and all those dark areas, you see them now, you don't have to worry about if you would have a, a, an accident there or something because you didn't see that or you didn't see this, right? So in the night, people tend to sleep. And even though sometimes you try to stay awake, you tend to fall asleep because night is for sleep. But the Bible said those who are um, children of the, uh, of the day, it said they don't sleep as do others, but watch and be sober. So I would tell you, we watching for the bridegroom. So the bridegroom is knocking. I'm not talking about knocking at your heart. But you say like, um, I accepted the Lord into my life and Jesus is in my, 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 in my life. I'm a born again Christian. Yes, that was the beginning of, of the journey, okay? That was the beginning of the journey. What happens hereafter, right? The scripture says, yeah, that was the beginning of the journey. It says here, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you, right? So, but some people think, well, yes, I have the kingdom of God now. Yes, you only started the journey. But what happens hereafter? Because as I said, when a person determined to serve God, you know, the devil will do anything possible to stop you from serving God. And you say, I'm determined. I am determined to hope, you know, to hold out to the end. And I'm no, not even that part yet. But I want it, I want I will I want to be saved and I want to serve Jesus and I give my life to Jesus. Okay? I said um, I've decided to follow Jesus. I've decided to follow Jesus, right? Now, so devil look and he said, if we have a, he talked to his comrades, his cronies, I said, you know, that one is a stubborn one in Look what we tried to prevent him and he still went ahead. He said, anyway, what he do is we have to do now make sure and he don't reach to the end, okay? Because if he doesn't reach to the end, it's just as good that he never started. 
the Bible said, yeah, be thou faithful unto death. The Bible said, um, we have to serve faithful to the end. Right? He that endure it and keep it, my works to the end. That's what the Bible said, to the end. So the devil said, well, you know, we have all manner things we can do to disturb the ship. And so the ship is going to turn into, we're going to wreck the ship along the way. Ah, oh, man, storms and trials and, and um, thorns, thorns and thistles and ah, oh, man, things we got to give them along the way, right? So that they never reach to the end. And it'll be a total crash. Well, the devil is a crash. The devils are a disaster. Do we want to end up like these devils? The answer is definitely no, right? We don't want to be like these devils. We will not be like these devils. They have no bridegroom coming for them. The bridegroom is not for them. The bride is to be taken out of the human race. Right? The human race from generation to generation. So, and God has put it inside us like the, the wheat with the tears that you are wheat. God has put it inside of you to be a sheep. As he is a good shepherd and he is a sheep, the Lord Jesus. The Bible said, none has found worthy to open the book except the, the Lamb. Okay? So, what do we want to do? I'm going to tell you, Joshua said, ask for me and my house, we serve a lot. I don't know about you my house, but I know for myself, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. Right? And I'm determined to hold on to the end. But what does that really mean? Does that mean that I must always be at church every day? And that's do everything they ask me to do at church, I must be always there. If they tell me to come to clean, I'll be there. If they tell me to wash and cook, I'll be there. And all these things. Is that what it is? Is that what it is? That's not what it is. Right? That's not what it is. Because it's something that is in the heart. It's in the heart. Right? It's in the heart. It's not something that is outside. It's something that's in the heart. And the Bible tells us clearly, it said, if God, um, let me see, see if I missed the verse here. And if you shall, um, verse 39, and this know, that if the good man of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched. I would not have suffered his house to be broken up. But be ye therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when he think not. So I hear people talking, you know, I had to revamp and think about some of the things even I used to think before. Because I don't want this to happen to me. Right? You know, they're thinking that, oh, they're going to be this kind of drama and this kind of drama. As I said to you, people are saying it. Just like that phenomenon that happened in China. They said it, the exact thing was in a movie near the end of the world. End of the world. And when you hear people talking about things now, even, even the people who are not saved are, are, are talking about these things. And I said, but you know, some of these things that happen here really look like things that were in the Bible. Things that were in Revelation. And Shouldn't you really pay attention? Shouldn't you pay attention to that? Because I'm saying the, the people who belong to the devil are saying that something is going on here. And as I said, the problem is that the people who are working for the devil, they know what our it is. But the people who are supposed to be for the church, they don't know what our it is. They keep telling you, you must hold on to the world, hold on to the world, hold on to it. When the whole thing is crumbling right before your very eyes. You know what I'm saying? Crumbling right before your very eyes. Our very eyes. You know, I spoke the other day about the, the, um, the, the big apartment that went down in Florida. It brought me back to 9 11. And, and you don't want to talk about all the corruption that was involved in that thing with 9 11. Right? And how many people lost their lives there. But that was a place of work. I know a lady personally, 
And she tell me she was supposed to have been at work that day. I said, God bless you, man. I mean, you know there's something special about you. God saved you that you weren't there that day. Okay? But that's a place of work. Right? In this apartment building, the place is a home. There's no safer place for you than your home. Isn't that true? So people were at home doing what people do at home. Right? I'm so exhausted. I talk about you come home, knock on the door, I ring the bell, right? And sit down. You look, oh, John is here. Open the door. John is so, um, any food? He goes straight to the fridge. Um, quick time. Mommy said, go wash your hands. We got in my fridge. Go wash your hands. Oh. I forgot. I wash my hands. He comes back. The quick time he makes a, a sandwich and makes um, you know, a cold drink and ah, that's so good. Alright? I'm home! Alright? When these people were in their homes, when they think this without a word of warning, it, it wasn't a time of war. I start with 9 11. Where somebody drop a bomb on it. And even now they say it, if you know you're gonna drop a bomb, you're supposed to tell the people to evacuate the building before you drop it. I don't know how those things work up, but I'm saying but, but it was deadly as if it was a bomb that dropped on it. And people lost their lives. Eventually they had to drop the whole building and leverage just to search for the people who were dead. Right? So I'm saying to you that. The time in which we live, right? The Bible says when he comes, he will knock at the door and he open immediately. Now if your house is not ready, you can't open immediately. But the thing is this, as I said, when you ask him for that extra five minutes to get ready, the Lord might just be coming at the fourth minute, at the third minute, at the second minute. After the first minute, he might just be coming that time. So you're not going to be able to get another five minutes to get ready. So we can't walk that kind of way. As I said to you, how much more time do you want to walk the Lord if you get an extra five minutes to get ready? How many more times? Because I said, if I ask you, Lord, for five minutes, I know you gave me five minutes already. I'm talking for myself. You gave me five minutes. And I want another five minutes, he gave it to me too. I want another five minutes, he gave it to me. But one day I got to the point where I said, well, you know, I can't live like this, be constantly wanting a five minutes and wanting this and wanting that. And what's going to happen if within that five minutes the light should come? What, and what should happen if I should, should just die? And my time, of, my years, I'm thinking that I have another five more minutes to live and there is maybe three and a half minutes. Right? I said four minutes or four and a half, it doesn't matter. Right? What I'm the point I'm making is this that we have to look at this thing realistically. And we have to be ready. When the bridegroom knocks, we can open to him immediately. I mean you know what I'm Scripture is not hard for me to, <laughs> to give it because I'm pretty much acquainted with them. But the bridegroom is knocking. Your bridegroom is knocking. Will you open to him? I'm not talking about a picture we used to be the, sh the shepherd, man looking like a shepherd with a staff. Okay? I'm saying that because that kind of picture is for like somebody who wants to be saved and need Christ in their life. I'm talking about now somebody who already have Christ in their life. But we have to keep in a state of order, a state of readiness. Because he's not really going to come and knock on your door. Anymore. 